I want to talk today about vomiting. That is the a bit about the physiology of vomiting and a bit about the drugs that we use for vomiting. Now vomiting, people don't like to vomit obviously, but vomiting is quite a good thing, evolutionarily speaking, because for 50,000 years, our ancestors staggered around the planet, putting everything they saw into their mouths to see if they could eat it. And of course, a lot of that stuff wasn't good for them. And so they vomited up. Now, uh, that's the reason that vomiting is good. There's lots of reasons why vomiting is bad. Number, you know, it's unpleasant, but ultimately the reason it's bad is because it's dangerous. Uh, first of all, you can aspirate whatever you're vomiting up if you suck some of that down into your lungs. That's not good for you. Uh, also, prolonged vomiting can lead to electrolyte disturbances and dehydration, which is specific, especially bad in little kids uh, and old people, which are, you know, totally different from the 18 to 50 year olds. Another reason it's bad is that uh, when you vomit, not only does the acid of your stomach come up, but also the digestive enzymes that are in your stomach. And digestive enzymes are not good for your gums and sort of the inside of your esophagus and other things like that. Um, if you have very severe vomiting, you can actually get a tear in your esophagus, which is quite dangerous as well. So lots of reasons not to puke. Um, so <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the physiology of vomiting. Now in what's my favorite part of the brain? The medulla oblongata, right? And in the medulla oblongata, there is something called the vomiting center. Uh, and the vomiting center is directly responsible for the actual act of vomiting. That is the act of having food shoot out of your mouth. Right now, there's other parts of your body which are responsible sort of for making you feel nauseous and for asking the vomiting center permission to make you vomit. But the vomiting center is definitely in charge there. Now, also in the medulla oblongata is something called the chemoreceptor trigger zone, which is sort of in the back of the medulla. And actually, it's in an area where the blood brain barrier isn't very um, very good. And so the chemo chemoreceptor trigger zone can monitor for toxins in the bloodstream that the medulla oblongata itself couldn't because those things wouldn't be able to cross the blood brain barrier. So the CTZ, the chemoreceptor trigger zone, is uh, good for watching out for toxins in the bloodstream. Now, other uh, parts of your body that contribute to vomiting include your stomach and intestines. Not only are there stretch or disten you know, distension receptors in your stomach and intestines, but there are also specialized cells that produce um, uh, serotonin that bind a particular kind of receptor, serotonin receptor, the serotonin receptor 3, uh, and that sends um, messages to your medulla oblongata to tell them that you know it's time to vomit and the messages are actually sent by my favorite nerve which is of course the vagus nerve right so the vagus nerve uh, sends information out from the brain towards the rest of the body and it also sends information uh, from the body back to the brain uh, on this little diagram I'm showing you I also have a listing there for vestibular apparatus vestibular system the vestibular system is actually incredibly complicated and uh, it is a system which allows us to move in space and know where we are in space and uh, it allows us to aim you know using stereo vision um, because if you think about it, it's quite a complicated thing to be sort of running around and hurling a spear at some animal uh, because you have to have not only stereo vision, but you have to know where your body is in space so that you can um, adjust your throw for uh, where you are in space. So uh, the vestibular system, that is quite responsible for a lot of the nausea associated with um, movement like car sickness and boat air sickness and boat sickness. Um, people like me who have vestibular migraine, we get sick from uh, our body just sort of has no idea where it is in space. Um, and so that's the vestibular system. Again, it doesn't, it doesn't itself make you vomit. It has to go to the vomiting center to um, initiate vomiting. Um, then I also have listed higher centers, which is sort of a term for you know, everything else. Um, and that's what is responsible for making you vomit um, when you, for instance, get extremely bad news. Sometimes people vomit or uh, you see something really disgusting. And in fact, the, the fact that when one person's vomit, the people around them tend to vomit at the same time. Um, that's also a, supposed to be an evolutionary thing in that, you know, if the tribe's all staggering around together, one guy picks up something, it makes him vomit, then everybody vomits and hopefully everybody in the clan survives. Uh, also, uh, you know, hearing and also being trained to vomit, which we'll talk about when we talk about chemotherapy drugs in a few minutes. Uh, can't think of anything else to 
mention right now. I'll put it on. Ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Uh, now you'll notice on this uh, figure I've given you, there's these little letters in each one of those sections, um, and those represent different kinds of receptors. So M1 is muscarinic, remember? H1 is histamine, yeah? Okay. Uh, DA is dopamine, di dopamine type 2 receptors. Um, there's a kind of receptor called the NK1 receptor, which binds lots of things, including substance P, which turns out to be quite important in terms of vomiting. Serotonin, the serotonin 3 receptor. 5-HT uh, is serotonin, remember? Uh, so uh, just keep that in mind. And there's other neurotransmitters that uh, help make you puke too. But let's, let's start there. All right, so now uh, let's talk about um, things, uh, drugs that make you vomit. All right, so you already know a couple, right? So you know that the Parkinson's type drugs, the ones that are dopamine type agonist drugs, will make you vomit. So that's like L-Dopa. Um, one that is uh, on the list of things that make you vomit is uh, apomorphine, which is, has nothing to do with morphine. It's a dopamine uh, drug, which is famous for making people vomit. It's also a Parkinson's drug. Uh, we've already talked about digoxin. You know, when you get high doses of that, it makes you vomit. Um, and uh, chemotherapy drugs are, are famous uh, for making people vomit. And in fact, uh, chemotherapy uh, drugs are so famous for making people vomit that some people don't go for cancer treatment because they're so afraid of the vomiting, which is unfortunate because not all chemotherapies make you vomit. And the ones that do, a lot of them nowadays can be controlled with drugs. So you don't necessarily have to be puking your guts out while you're uh, going through chemotherapy for cancer. We'll come back to that in a second. Another uh, thing that I want to mention is um, syrup of Ipecac. And uh, if you go to your granny's house, she probably has some syrup of Ipecac in her cupboard because in the olden days, as in, you know, more than 10 years ago, um, everybody kept syrup of Ipecac in their cupboard because the idea was that if you um, poisoned, you got poisoned with something, that you would take syrup of Ipecac, that would make you vomit, and then you'd throw up whatever it was that was making you puke, which is, uh, fine, but except for these, all these things I mentioned already that are bad, you know, when you vomit, you don't want to necessarily vomit. And in fact, there was a guy in, I lived in the chemistry, co-ed chemistry fraternity when I was in college. And there was a guy there who had this bright idea that he would drink all he wants and then he'd take syrup of Ipecac and then empty his stomach out and then he wouldn't have a hangover the next day. Um, so in fact, what happened was he took syrup of Ipecac after drinking heavily uh, and then he spent the entire night vomiting because it's such a strong emetic. And it actually works by um, stimulating the uh, inside of the stomach and sort of upper, upper intestinal cells to produce serotonin, which pr stimulates this 5-HT3 uh, receptor, which then makes you vomit. So that's, that's not a good way to do it. Anyway, uh, you, you absorb alcohol pretty quickly anyway, so uh, you pretty much just have to not drink so much. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the way you deal with that. Don't drink so much. Okay, so those are some drugs that make you vomit. Uh, now let's talk about some of the drugs that uh, keep you from vomiting. And in your handout, I have a list of a bunch of drugs. And, and, and the thing I really want you to take home from this more than anything else is that there's lots of drugs that are, can help you not puke. And they're, different drugs are good for different types of vomiting. Uh, and, uh, just, and there's so many different neurotransmitters and target uh, receptors that you can use for uh, vomiting. So I, I'm giving you an example of each one of the classes. Most of these you already know, uh, and I, you know I'd want you to be able to recognize those drugs and what class of drugs they are, because later in your career you can sort of learn all the different drugs from each class. Okay, so the first one on the list I think is the phenothiazines, uh, which has got pen, uh, compensine and phenergan, um, and down at the bottom, uh, and, and there's also uh, metoclopramide, which is Reglan, um, and these are all drugs that are anti-dopamine. So anti-dopamine drugs tend to be really good to help you stop vomiting. Now, I think on one of the tests I mentioned, you know, haloperidol can also be used uh, as an anti-vomiting drug, even though it's an antipsychotic mostly. Um, but anything that's got anti-dopamine action, you can use for vomiting. Now, the problem is, is that all those anti-dopamine drugs have all of the uh, usual um, side effects of an antipsychotic, which means the movement disorders, 
like the akathisia and dystonic reactions and the parkinsonism and at worst the tardive dyskinesia so you have to sort of decide which you know if, if that's the drug you're going to use you have to be aware of these these possibilities of these side effects um, but again sometimes that's the best drug to use in a very particular situation Another drug class you already know about are the anticholinergics. Remember, cholinergic drugs make you explode. Everything comes out of you, you know, poop and vomit and everything comes out, uh, salivation. And anticholinergics sort of calm things down. Uh, so the anticholinergic drugs, uh, we already mentioned scopolamine, which is the one that uh, is in the patch you can wear in the, on a cruise ship for boat sickness. All right. So anticholinergic drugs can do that. And they're, of course, binding muscarinic receptors, which is the M1 in that other diagram. Okay, uh, what else did I talk about? Oh, okay, oh, yay! Another one is antihistamines. Um, again, Benadryl, awesome drug, right? It, it, could, it makes you sleepy, it uh, helps you when you have allergies, uh, and it's good for um, nausea. And so the antihistamines work pretty well to help reduce nausea, particularly the first generation antihistamines, which cross the blood brain barrier and therefore work on the brain. Um, Dramamine for air sickness and meclizine for vertigo. Vertigo is a kind of dizziness where you feel like you're being pulled towards the ground. And so uh, the antihistamines, and they're binding the H1 histamine receptor in this case in order to have their anti-nausea activities. Um, so let's talk about some of the new drugs that you haven't encountered before. Uh, there's a drug called Odansetron, which is an anti- serotonin drug, so it's a serotonin blocker. Um, now you might say, well, wait a minute, we were talking about serotonin, when we were talking about serotonin reuptake inhibitors and depression, those are drugs that are indirect acting drugs um, that just increase the, amount, the circulating levels of serotonin. Now serotonin, we haven't talked about the fact that it has incredibly complicated receptor system. So they, it's not just, you know, beta one, beta two, beta three receptors like in the sympathetics. There's at least seven major classes of serotonin receptor. Some of them are inhibitory, some of them are excitatory. It's very confusing and weird. The, the anti-vomit drugs like Odansetron, all those end with citron. That's how you can tell that that's the class of drugs. Um, the Odansetron and similar drugs work by blocking specifically the serotonin-3 receptor, one of those. So that's it's it's not like the exact opposite of the SSRIs because the SSRIs were sort of a blanket agonist, you know, sort of all over your whole body. Whereas the anti-serotonin drug, odansetron, specifically is targeting these 5-HT3 receptors. All right, so that's a drug that has been a, a boon to uh, treating chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, or CINV, is the sort of way you uh, abbreviate that. And uh, another drug which has been a big boon to uh, CINV treatment is Eprepotent, which is um, a NK1 receptor um, drug, and that's actually blocking the effect of substance P to make you puke. So um, that those two are sometimes combined. Also, they tend to be combined with dexamethasone. Dexamethasone is a corticosteroid like all the other corticosteroids we talked about. So these are all drugs that act like the normal glucocorticoid in your body, like cortisol, hydrocortisone, prednisone, beclomethasone, fluticasone, all, you know, methylprednisolone, uh, all those drugs are steroids. They tend to be good anti-inflammatories. And it turns out that in combination with some of these other drugs, um, they can be excellent for, in, uh, you know, stopping chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Uh, now, I want to mention a couple other quick ones. One is, um, I mentioned this learned response where you can learn to, be, to vomit sort of on command. Um, so for instance, when I was in college, I once ate an entire box of Nilla cherries, which were these sort of disgusting chocolate covered cherries with goo inside. Um, and then I puked. And since then, I can't even look at a box without feeling nauseated. So that's, I'm, a lot of people have that experience with one food or another. And, and again, that's what your body's supposed to do. It's supposed to find things that make you puke and then make it so you don't eat it again, so you don't die. Um, but that's a learned response. And the chemotherapy patients really get this bad because you know they go in for their um, round of chemotherapy and if they had a bad experience with vomiting the first, the previous time, they get, they get very anxious about that they're gonna vomit when they get their drug. And that anxiety can actually make them vomit. So in that case, you can use an anti-anxiety drug like one of the benzodiazepines like Valium or, I'm sorry, diazepam or lorazepam. Uh, and that is not treating the nausea per se. It's treating the symptoms of the nausea, the anxiety to prevent 
the nausea from happening. So that's sort of an unusual situation, but that, that works too. Um, also, there's some over-the-counter, other over-the-counter drugs you can use. There's one called, I think, Emetrol, which is just basically, um, it's sort of like cola. It's like very thick cola. It's got uh, some fructose in it and glucose and sucrose. It's like sugar and I think phosphoric acid. I can't, I'm not sure for sure. Uh, but that's um, Emetrol and people swear by it, say that it works quite well. Um, so, you know, whatever works. There's also acupuncture, which seems to help. Um, so there's lots of options for treating nausea and vomiting, and um, you don't have to necessarily suffer through it um, because there's a lot of options for treatment. Okay. Another thing is there's a drug that came out about 30 years ago, and it was a combination of vitamin B6 and an antihistamine. And it was uh, used, people, it was indicated for morning sickness. And then of course, you know, with any drug that a woman uses during pregnancy, if her kid, you know, is no good at math when they're eight years old, um, then they go back and sue the drug company because they say, oh, look, see, you know, yeah, I took this drug and my kid came out weird. Um, and uh, so the, at the time, the drug company withdrew the drug from the market, even though it worked well, uh, because they just got inundated with frivolous lawsuits and they just decided it wasn't worth it to stay in, to keep making this drug. It was just ridiculous. So that was 30 years ago. And since that time, you know, there's all, this happens over and over again, where online um, sort of grassroots organizations decide they don't like some medication. And then they, you know, uh, bother the legislature to get rid of the drug, even though it's fine. This is the same thing happens with uh, the GMOs and with, um, you know, aspartame and uh, we already talked about teotropium. You know, th this happens over and over again. Anyway, so the FDA has had this drug and the OBGYN community has been begging the FDA to, to approve it again because it's such, it works well. And finally, after 30 years, they've now said, yes, this drug actually doesn't hurt pregnant women, and you can now sell it again, and it's being sold under the trade name of Diclegis? I'll, I'll look it up. Diclegis? Diclegis, I think. Um, and again, it's just a combination of an antihistamine, a uh, particular antihistamine and vitamin B6. And it's too bad because uh, it could be an over-the-counter drug uh, because of what's in it. Uh, except that when a, a drug is being taken f by pregnant women, you have to be quite careful about um, the purity of the drug and make sure there's nothing else in it and make sure that what's in the pill is actually what you say is in the pill, which unfortunately you can't get with supplements. But anyway, that's an interesting uh, situation that just came out uh, last year. So now pregnant women maybe don't have to suffer with morning sickness quite as much as they used to.